these things I have spoken unto you or said unto you that in me you might have peace. God wants you to have his peace that passes understanding. In the world you shall have tribulation. It's not going to be easy in this world. You'll have lots of difficult times, but be of good courage or good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus gave us good news. I've overcome this stuff. Okay. And then we did this last time and we know that not just some, but all things work together for good to them that Sunil, what? Love God to them who are the Remember I said he, he does this to us. He draws us to himself. He called according to his purpose. Very good. So God has a purpose. He calls this to himself. He draws us to himself, grants us repentance and faith. And then he causes all things to work together for good, even the rough times. All right, today's verse. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved brothers, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. By the way, uh, this is uh, this may be the last verse in the chapter. It's really close to the end. I think it's the last verse. And, and, and the whole chapter is about the resurrection. It starts out talking about the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to talk more about that in this class, not, not long from now. Resurrection of Jesus, and how important it is, and how accurate it is, how true it is. So he's, he's talking about the resurrection. Of Jesus. And then he talks about our resurrection. One of these days, we're going to have new bodies. We're going to be raised from the dead with new bodies. And he says, in light of all this truth, the, the, the fact that Jesus really is raised from the dead, and the fact that we're going to be raised from the dead, and we're going to be with him someday in glorified bodies, if we're trusting him, he says, so because of all of that, we see a therefore. You always look in the Bible to see what the therefore is. Therefore, right? You remember that. You've heard that before. See what it's there for. And it's therefore because he talks about all this stuff about the resurrection. My beloved brothers, be, and this means, you know, when I say the stay in the battle a lot, that, that, that's, that's talking about this. It, it may be a new word to you. I don't know. Uh, it means don't quit. Do you want to? I don't know if I can give you a hint or not other than that. Uh, it's a Bible word that, we, that you see from time to time that means don't quit. Just keep on, keep it on, keep it on, keep it on. Stay in the battle. Be S-T-E. Steadfast. Very good. Trim. Steadfast. Be steadfast. Be steadfast. Be steadfast. And this means uh, kind of like standing firm. Uh, yeah, immovable. Good. It's very good. Steadfast and immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, you're, and this is a synonym for work. Starts with an L. What's another word for work? Labor. Very good. Your labor is not in vain. Very good. Very good. Excellent. 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 Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. I was going to leave out the A when I spelled it a while ago. S-T-E-A-D. Steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord your neighbor's labor is not in vain. Now, why did he have to say that? Because he knew that a lot of us Christians would be trying our best to live for the Lord, and sometimes it seemed like it's not turning out very good. I mean, Lord, I'm trying to live for you, I'm trying to serve you. It's just not working here, is it? And he says, Yes, it is. It's just not working according to your time schedule. I've got my own time schedule, God says. I know what I'm doing. Remember that in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Remember that? It's the same thing he's saying here. In, in due season, you'll see that it's not in vain. It wasn't worthless. It wasn't pointless. It wasn't meaningless. It counted. You, the, when you do, when you serve the Lord, bounding in the work of the Lord, whatever it might be. In your case, we, we all have different responsibilities. We all have different lives to live. You know, some of it's in the home, in our home, to be the kind of child and or adult that God wants us to be in the home. Whether it's how, it's, how we relate to other people, how we relate to chores, how we relate to responsibilities. Uh, how we relate to just activities in the home. We, we all do it in a Christ-like way. Sometimes it's here at the school. You know, how we, how do we interact with each other? How do I get my schoolwork done? I need to do it in a Christ-like way. I'm doing it for the for the Lord. Uh, it may be at the church. I'm doing what I do at the church for the glory of the Lord. Maybe on a job. You're doing what you're, what you're doing for the Lord. You're doing free time. You want to do it for the Lord. You want to abound in the work of the Lord, whatever it might be for you. It would be different for every one of us. <clears throat> But whatever he's given you to do, whatever your life is composed of, make sure you're serving him. It's the work of the Lord. And it's not in vain. You'll be glad you did it one of these days. And if you don't do it, if you say, fooey on this, I'm going to live the way I want to live. Okay, but you're headed for destruction. You're not going to like the results. All right, <clears throat> let's memorize it. 
Therefore, my beloved brothers, therefore, my beloved brothers, therefore, you can say beloved if you want to, therefore, my beloved brothers, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Therefore, my beloved brothers, my beloved brothers, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be steadfast, be steadfast, immovable, be steadfast, immovable. Always abounding, two A's there together, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. Abounding means overflowing. Just doing as much as you can. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's one reason we call our website Abounding Joy. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. <clears throat> Always abounding in the work of the Lord. The Lord's work. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. 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 Okay, how's it start? Therefore, my beloved, what? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be what? Steadfast, immovable. Remember the next two two words start with A. Always abounding in what? No, in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing something. Knowing. Amen. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Okay. Awesome. Anything you want to say before I pray? Okay, Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for their love for you. Thank you for their love for your word. Thank you for giving us your word and that we are in a school where we can do what we're doing right now. We can talk to you. We can we can look at your word together. We can learn from your word. Let you talk to our hearts, speak to our hearts, and teach us. So thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for 1 Corinthians 15. Thank you for telling us all about the resurrection of Jesus and giving us evidence for his resurrection. Thank you for reminding us that we're going to be raised one of these days, that these bodies we're in right now aren't meant to last forever. They're going to wear out. They're going to be replaced. And you're going to give us glorified spiritual bodies one of these days when Jesus comes back. So, Lord, help us to to uh, rejoice in that fact and to remember it and to live in light of that truth. <clears throat> and, Lord, thank you for reminding us here this morning that uh, we need to always be steadfast and we need to be immovable. Don't let anybody move us from where we stand in you. Don't let anybody convince us uh, something silly and something false and something ridiculous just because the whole lot of the world believes it. Lord, help us just to keep our focus on you and be steadfast and immovable. And Lord, help us to always abound in your work, whatever you've given us to do. Lord, I know it's different for every one of us, but we want to be sensitive to you to do what you put us here to do that will bring you glory because we know even when we feel like it's not working, Lord, and you know sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we feel like, what's the use? What's the point? You've told us very clearly here, our labor is not in vain when we're living for you, when we're working for you. So help us, Lord, to, to do what you put us here to do, to be the kind of kids, the kind of parents, the kind of brothers and sisters, the kind of friends uh, that you want us to kind of, kind of brothers and sisters in Christ that you want us to be. We want to be like Jesus, so help us, Lord, to think more like Jesus, to think biblically, and to live in a way that will honor you and bless others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> now, we have finally reached the point, after a full quarter and a little bit of a second quarter, of, of what this course is really all about. It's, it's about learning the evidences for what we believe, how we Christians know that what we believe is true. There are going to be times, and you'll hear me say some of this on these videos, but there are going to be times when you will run into people who laugh at your Christianity. They'll roll their eyes. They'll say, oh, I can't believe you believe that stupid stuff. That's, that's backward hick stuff. That's ignorant stuff. People don't believe that anymore. They're wrong, <laughs> but there will be people trying to make fun of you for your faith in Christ. They'll try to make you think you're being ignorant or, or just superstitious or something like that. So God knew that would happen. So he says, listen, I'm giving you lots of evidence. You know, a lot of people think to become a Christian, you got to kind of close your eyes and your ears and take a leap in the dark without any evidence at all. God says, no, you got to trust me, but I'm going to give you evidence. You want to have some evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? I'll give it to you. You want to have evidence that you can trust my word? I'll give it to you. You want to have evidence that I'm really God? I'll give it to you. You just got to be willing to look at it. And a lot of Christians don't know this stuff. I wish this were taught in all churches. I think it ought to be. But... If you guys will pay attention the rest of the year, you're going to learn some really valuable stuff to help you help other people know what we believe is true. You will run into people from time to time who say, I'd like to believe what you 
believe it. I can't. I just don't think dead men rise from the dead. I just don't think that can happen. I, I don't think that old book could be worth anything. It's an old, old, old book written by a bunch of shepherds and guys like that. I mean, you can't trust that book. And and and, and you, if you if you pay attention to what we're doing in here and make make it a point to learn it, you'll be able to answer those questions. That's what we're talking about here. So it'll help you be steadfast and immovable. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so the first thing I need to do is give you that. Well, hey, kids, thanks for joining me in this study today, watching this video with me. I'm really praying and hoping that you'll take this very, very seriously. I wish I could kind of underline how important I think these things are, but I can't overstate it. I just think it's so, so very important for us to understand what I'm going to be talking about today. Let me tell you just a little bit about myself. When, when I was a little kid, I grew up in Teleco Plains, Tennessee. I grew up in a time and in a place, I guess I need to add, when basic Christianity was just pretty much assumed by everybody. And it had been assumed for several generations. I mean, I just assumed that my friends were going to be Christians. My parents were Christians. My grandparents, they kind of assumed the same thing. Now, we knew there were non-Christians around. But even the non-Christians tended to recognize that the Bible really is God's word. They didn't seem to doubt that. They, they had a kind of respect for us Christians and a respect for the Bible and respect for Jesus, even though they may not be really following Jesus themselves. But almost everybody I knew kind of fit into that category. We just assumed it was true. Uh, that sounds like a really cool time to be alive, and in a way it was, but it had a bad downside. <laughs> it led to a kind of complacency among us Christians. It would have been shocking, I think, for any of us at that time to have heard somebody ask, how do you know that what you believe is true? Nobody asked us that question. I mean, I'm sure in other places they were asking that question, but not where we live, not when I live. It was just assumed. We all assumed it. We were a Christian group. We were a Christian culture, Christian community, Christian society. We felt like we lived in a Christian nation. And if anyone had asked us that question, most of us would have said, hey, that's just what we believe. We've always believed it. It never occurred to us that anyone might actually ask us why we believed it. For that reason, I think many Christians who have been raised a lot like I was raised, have never developed the ability to answer those tough kinds of questions. And that's really bad. That's sad. That's not okay. And now times have changed and they are rapidly changing even more. And I believe with all my heart that our ignorance in the church among Christians about what we call basic Christian apologetics, if you haven't heard that term, we'll talk more about it later, but it has to change. We have to be able to answer these questions. we got to change it very quickly. We've already waited way too long. We're living in a world and at a time that's rushing into a dark kind of secularism. And it seems like it's becoming more and more non-Christian almost daily. And we Christians, if we really are Christians, need to be able to articulate how we know that what we believe is true. How do we know it's true? And if all we've got is, well, I hope it's true. I've always assumed it's true. My parents said it was true. We're in trouble. <laughs> we need to know how we know it's true. And we need to be able to tell others. And we need to be able to do it in a gracious way, but a persuasive way. Because, listen, this is important. <laughs> God has seen fit to leave us an amazing amount of evidence. And he's left it for us so that we can study it and learn it and share it with those who don't know the truth, who've been deceived. But sadly, and it's really, really sad, too many of us Christians have just neglected to equip ourselves with that knowledge of that evidence. It's work. It takes discipline. It takes time. We just have gotten involved in other things, and we've neglected this very, very important part of our Christian faith. So, Lord willing, over the next few studies that I'm going to be sharing with you, I hope we're going to be looking at some of this evidence. I hope you can stay with me here. 
1999, Vicki and I moved back to Tennessee and I became a teacher at Teleco Plains High School. And from 1999 to 2006, I was the FCA sponsor at Teleco Plains High School. I taught math and physics and ACT prep. And in 2006, after a lot of prayer and thought and study, out of the FCA group, we created and launched a brand new Christian club. We call it the Veritas Club. It really wasn't associated with FCA, but it's the same group of kids. Veritas is the Latin word for truth. Happens to be the motto at Harvard University. <laughs> Actually, their entire motto is Veritas Christo et Ecclesia. It means truth for Christ in the church. <laughs> they don't much believe in their motto anymore. There's hardly anybody up there even believes in truth anymore, I don't think. <laughs> but we do, and we like that motto, so we said, hey, let's just use it. My motivation to start the club at, at Teleco was my grief and my frustration that we're just losing so many kids to secularism once they graduated from high school and left home. And many of them, before they even left high school, were embracing kind of a secular way of thinking. Some still call themselves Baptists or Methodists or whatever, but they were embracing secularism dropping out of church in droves eventually. And that problem's all over the country. It's a massive problem. And I thought, you know, there are lots of reasons for this. And we talked about some of the reasons why kids drop out. But I was convinced and still am that one of the reasons that many, many young people, young adults drop out of church is because they're just not well equipped to answer the really tough questions that they're going to run into when they get into college or when they get into work, the workforce somewhere and they start interacting with more secular thinking people. They get, they get questions and they can't answer them. Now, this is not a new problem. I mean, the, even I, when I was a kid, I, by this time I was in college, but I can remember going through some of those struggles when I entered college myself. That was back in the 60s. I enrolled at the University of Tennessee. I'll, I may share some of those details with you later. I won't get into that right now. But So it's not really a new thing. It's just the problem is so much bigger now. It's growing exponentially now, seems to me anyway. And too many of our kids, and really too many of our adults, just don't know how to explain to secular thinking people how we know that what we believe is true. The theme verse we chose for Veritas is 1 Peter 3.15 which is often considered to be the theme verse for any Christian apologetic study. First Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Holy means set apart. So set apart Jesus Christ in your heart as Lord. Make sure he's Lord of your life in your heart. And then look at the rest of this verse. Always being prepared, or being ready to make a defense. King James says, give an answer, but make a defense is probably the best translation here. To anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Why do you have this hope as Christians? Can you make a defense? God says, you've got to. It's a command. He didn't finish there. He says, do it with gentleness and respect. Now, we'll talk more about this verse later on in these studies. But our goal was to help young people get equipped to answer some of the really tough questions they're going to likely have to deal with. Questions that a lot of unbelievers enjoy asking Christians. Sometimes skeptics ask those questions because they really do want to know the answer. They're curious. Are there answers to these questions? But sometimes skeptics, they have no desire to know the truth. They just know they can pin Christians down and make Christians squirm by asking these tough questions because they don't think many Christians have good answers and most Christians don't. You say, well, what kind of question are you talking about? Well, questions like this. How do we know that the Bible can be trusted? That's a biggie. How do we know the Bible can be trusted? How can you be so sure that Jesus rose from the dead? That's a huge question. How do we know he rose from the dead? Is it just a myth? Why are you Christians so intolerant? A lot of Christians don't know how to answer that. Don't you know the Bible's full of errors and inaccuracies and contradictions? How can you say there's a good God when you look at all the evil there is in the world? Wouldn't he put a stop to it? How can you be so arrogant and unkind as to tell someone else that what they believe is wrong? They have their truth. You have your truth. 
you realize, don't you, that all real scientists accept evolution as an unquestioned fact. How can you possibly believe in creation? Did you realize the Bible is actually an evil book? It even advocates the slaughter of babies. Why are you Christians so judgmental? Can't you recognize that the beliefs of other people are just as valid as yours? Don't you realize that Christians have been responsible for most of the world's problems out there? Have you ever heard of the Crusades or the witch trials or the Inquisition or slavery? <laughs> and a lot of Christians just, they're dumbfounded. They don't know what to say. Now, there are really good, solid, biblical Christian answers to these questions and others like them. But I became convinced that when students started hearing questions like this, that a lot of them just felt overwhelmed. And the tendency for many of them was simply, oh man, I don't know. And they just kind of withdraw into their shell and just quietly drop, drop out of church. Did you know there have been some surveys that, that indicate that at least in some places in the country, as many as 70% or even more students who attend church while they're in high school drop out when they graduate from high school? Now, thankfully, it's not that bad everywhere, but it's bad, bad enough, whatever it is. We need to help these kind of kids get answers. Now, here's the deal. I already referred to this, but in order to be able to answer these kind of questions, it takes some mental effort. If I were to ask a group of Christian people this question, if I were to ask you, do you love Jesus? I think many, many of them, maybe all of them would say, oh, of course I love Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart. And that's wonderful. And I'm glad. I hope that's your answer, that you love Jesus with all your heart. I love Jesus with all my heart. But there's more to it than to loving Jesus. And Jesus said the greatest commandment of all was that we what? Do you remember this greatest commandment? When he said, when they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. But he didn't put a period there. He didn't stop there. He said, also with all your soul. And also with all your strength. And then also, you remember the rest of it? With all your mind. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. So Jesus said, yes, love God, not, but not just with your heart, with your soul and your mind. There's another verse in the Bible that says, we need to gird up the loins of our minds. That implies mental discipline. Do you understand this? The Christian life is meant to be a life of discipline. It's all the way through the scripture. When he mentions the fruit of the spirit, when he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit over Galatians chapter five, the last thing on that list is self-control. That implies some discipline. And far too many Christians have just kind of drifted into a kind of laziness when it comes to the things of God. It's kind of weird. It's kind of strange. We'll discipline our minds to try to do better in school. We know that takes work. We'll discipline ourselves to try to improve our ACT scores. We'll work on that really hard. Some kids discipline themselves to be successful in their future job. That's important. They know it's important. And it is. I'm not minimizing this. Some kids discipline themselves so they can excel in some kind of sport or maybe in dance or maybe in gymnastics. They know the importance of discipline. We, we know that. Almost everything we want to accomplish but somehow we find ourselves not putting the energy into disciplining our minds for Jesus. And that's not okay, guys. It really isn't okay. We can't be a floating, lazy Christian. We've got to learn how to obey God's command in 1 Peter 3.15 by being disciplined. Now, it turns out, like I already said, God's chosen to leave us lots of evidence for anyone who's willing to consider it with an openness to go where the evidence leads. I know there are people out there who are not. We'll talk about those later too. But there's evidence that God's given us for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. There's evidence that he's given us from the field of archaeology. There's evidence that he's left from fulfilled prophecy. Amazing evidence. There's evidence from early church history. There's evidence from Bible manuscripts. There's evidence from science like molecular biology and the fine tuning of the universe and the second law of thermodynamics. And Lord willing, over a period of time, we're going to be looking at some of this evidence. There are a lot of opinions out there about who Jesus is. 
but God seemed fit to put the evidence together in such a way that it's very difficult for people who want to reject the Jesus that's revealed in scripture and just kind of make up an imaginary Jesus of their own. A lot of people want to do that. God makes that really tough for them. We need to know how that works. We'll have a look at that. And by the way, the dominant religious worldview in America today is probably a religion that actually tries many times to deny that it's a religion, but it is. It's, it's the religion of the worldview called secular humanism. We're going to have a look at that, Lord willing. Try to understand what they believe and how they contrast with Christians. I also want us to spend some time in this series thinking about some of the other tough questions that young Christians need to be prepared to answer these days. There are a lot of tough questions that we need to look at. We'll also talk about the importance of having a spiritual mentor, the danger of falling into a moral trap that Satan sets for a lot of young adults that causes them to wind up doubting the scriptures. We'll talk about the different kinds of skeptics. There are different kinds of skeptics. They're not all alike. We have to be able to relate to the different skeptics in different ways. We'll talk about the importance of learning how to stand alone. There are times when Christians need to be able to stand alone. We'll talk about a lot of these kind of issues. So I hope you'll stay tuned and I hope you'll be engaged and I hope you'll be willing to ask God to help you be disciplined, to learn what you need to learn here. So before we stop today, I want us to briefly look just one more time at the theme verse, 1 Peter 3.15. Let's just look at it one more time. We'll be coming back to it again later. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Set apart Jesus as Lord in your heart. Always being prepared, always, always, always being prepared, being equipped, being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. By the way, the Greek word for defense there is apologia. Apologia. It's the basis for the Christian area of study that we call Christian apologetics which is basically a study of the evidence that God's given us so that we can use it to help others know why we believe what we believe is true. So God's given us a command. And over the next few weeks, maybe, maybe next few months, I hope that with God's help, I can help you be a little better equipped to obey this command. I hope you'll stay in that battle, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for every human being who's been watching this video, especially the kids who've been involved here. And Lord, I thank you that you're working right now in their hearts. And I pray that you would bring conviction to their hearts that these things are critical. I pray you'd help them to understand that they're going to be running into a lot of people in days to come with a lot of tough questions. Some of them will be hostile. Some of them will be genuine. But Lord, I pray that you'd help more and more of us to get better and better equipped to obey this command you've given us in first peter three fifteen to be ready to give an answer to make a defense to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us father you've given us an amazing hope you've given us eternal life in jesus he's risen from the dead you're the creator the creator of the universe the creator of all that lives you're the sustainer of this. Lord. You've given us your word, your book, to teach us about yourself and to teach us the truth about ourselves and the world we live in. And Lord, we're living in a day when many, many people doubt all of this. They doubt you. They doubt Jesus rose from the dead. They doubt your word is true. And yet you've given us so much evidence. So Lord, help us to be disciplined and to get equipped so that we can share that evidence as you give us opportunity so that others might know the truth and that you might draw them to yourself and they too might find eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. Be in charge of us, Lord. Get glory through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now I just want to talk about this a little bit the time we got left. Do you remember some of the things I said? I started by talking about why I thought it's more important to study this kind of stuff than it was when I was young, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Do, do you do you remember anything I said about that? Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Parker. Yeah, we live, more of us now live in a world where we're communicating and, and in contact with and hearing from lots of non-Christians, you know, secular humanists especially. Of course, critical theory is a big, I didn't mention critical theory there. I'll get into that later too. But, but there's a lot of non-Christian thinking out there 
that I never was exposed to growing up in Delco Plains as a kid in the 1950s. You know, I mean, we just all of us. I mean, not everybody was a Christian. Don't get me wrong. There were, were non-Christians there. But even the non-Christians kind of recognize that, okay, God's real and the Bible's his book, but we just, we're just we just not ready to serve Jesus yet. If you talk to people who weren't Christians that day, they would usually say, oh, I'm just not ready yet. They would think, yeah, I know this is true. I'm just not ready yet. And so they would kind of resist serving Jesus. But but uh, in general, we just accepted a biblical world. We had today, especially with the Internet and, you know, all the social media, all the stuff on YouTube, all the stuff on videos. Uh, so much streaming video now, I mean, so much of it is non-Christian. And so uh, we have to be able to know why we believe what we believe. Do you remember what the word Veritas, I use the word Veritas, I call this the Veritas Club when I started at Teleco many years ago. Do you remember what the word Veritas meant? Truth, Truth. very good. Yes. It's a. It's not a Greek word. Sometimes people think it's Greek because the New Testament is written in Greek. Do you remember what it is? Latin. Latin, very good. It's a Latin word. Yeah. But of course, the Roman Empire, they spoke uh, Greek and Latin. Latin was the primary language there in Rome. Um, and then the, do you remember why we chose that for the for, at Teleco for the name of the club? You remember who else used Veritas as a motto? Harvard, Harvard University. <laughs> That's amazing. They don't even believe in truth up there anymore. But do, do you know how Harvard University was started? I don't know if you've heard the story. It's the oldest university in the United States. And it started as a Christian school to equip Preachers and pastors and ministers. That's what it was for. That's what. It was, that's why they started it. But of course, long ago they left that behind. They became very, very secularized, and and they're not at all Christian now. So, but their motto was not just Veritas. It was Veritas for Christ, Truth for Christ in the Church. That was their motto. It's amazing. Still is, as far as I know. I don't think they ever officially changed it, but they just don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> all right. Um, so. Uh, do you remember some of the things I shared that, were, that, that that happened in my own life or what things I was thinking that kind of led to the, uh, the the starting of the club at Teleco? It's all right if you don't, but does anybody remember any of that? I, I went through some struggles of my own when I was younger. I started questioning, is this really true? I mean, how do I know this is really true? i, I tell you something that happened to me. It may not have happened to you. When I was a little bitty kid, my parents taught me that Santa Claus was real. So I grew up thinking Santa Claus was real. I finally got old and I thought, this just doesn't really make sense. <laughs> and so I started asking my parents, is Santa really real? And they told me the truth. No, oh, no, it was just something we kind of had fun with. That. Their parents had taught them Santa was real. And it was just kind of fun. But after that, it wasn't too long after that story, I thought, I wonder if somebody going to tell me the same thing about Jesus, that he's not real either. <laughs> And I wondered, of course, that wasn't that didn't happen because he is real. But I struggled with that for a while. And then when I got older and started hearing some of these questions, this was mainly in, in and after college. I started getting really, really. I, I, I can remember going out to a park one time. I was probably 20, maybe 20 or 21 years old. And I remember looking up and saying, Lord, I don't know if you're really there or not, but if you are, I want to get this right. You know, I mean, it's like I was praying to God, but I wasn't even sure he was real at that time. Now, I'm still convinced I was a Christian. I was just going through a period of doubt. But uh, but I struggled with some of this myself, and he finally got me in contact with some of this uh, some of this information that I share here. So, And then, and then of course, I was also concerned, when I, this is many, many, many years later, when I'm teaching now at Telco Plains High School, and, and I realized, wow, so many kids, go to church all the way up through high school because their parents make them and they take them to church. And then as soon as they graduate and they get out on their own, they quit. And I think, why are they quitting? What's going on? And, and one of the reasons I think they quit is because they weren't sure about this. Is it really true? How can I know it's true? And they didn't know how to answer it. And, and they were getting answered those tough que- asked those tough questions and they couldn't answer them. You remember what the theme verse is? <clears throat> That's a good verse and it's an important verse to us, but there's another verse that we use for a theme verse. Did I write that down? It's First Peter three fifteen, and it says, "In your heart, set a Christ, set apart Christ Jesus as Lord. Always being ready to do what? Do you remember? To make a defense. King James says, "Give an answer, make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you." So be ready, he says. You need to get equipped. Be ready to make a defense. And so that's what this course is all about. That's why we call it a theme verse. We're trying to get people ready to answer the questions. Now, did you pick up on any, on number six, I've, I've got about 10 of those questions listed here. 
uh, some of the tough questions that Christians hear or get asked or maybe just think and uh, that they don't have answers for. Can you can you think of any of those questions that I mentioned? OK, how do you know Jesus is really risen from the dead? Because a lot of people say, that doesn't make sense to me. Dead men don't rise. No dead man rises from the dead. That's against the laws of nature. I, I can't believe he rose from the dead. Not really. So a lot of people would kind of make it into a spiritual thing. Oh, I, I kind of think he, he, he his body's still dead, but he, he, he kind of lived in the lives and minds of his apostles, and they'll, they'll come up with nonsense like that. But they don't really believe in the resurrection. They're not Christians. They just kind of have this nice warm feeling about Jesus somehow, his thought or his whatever. Uh, so that's a good question. Anything else come to mind? How do you know you can trust the Bible? How do you know the Bible's true? God's given us lots of evidence for that. We'll talk about that. Anything else come to mind? How can you judge a non-Christian? Yeah, yeah. How, how can you say somebody else is wrong? I mean, their truth is just as valid as your truth. You've got no business condemning them. Judge, how can you be so judgmental as to tell them they're wrong? <clears throat> their beliefs are just as valid as yours. Okay, anything else come to mind? One is, is, is simply, how can you know there's a God? I don't know if I've mentioned that one or not. <clears throat> Some people will say, this is a big one. They'll say, how can you say there's a good God when there's so much evil out there in the world? Wouldn't God fix it if he, if he had the power? And if he doesn't, he must not be very loving because if he was loving, he'd fix it. And, and, there, and there are people, there's a lot of Christians think, well, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, another one. A lot of people like to ridicule Christians who say, I believe God created this world, this universe, like, like it is. He created it. And he created life. And a lot of people say, come on. All the scientists are evolutionists, right? They're all evolutionists. <clears throat> Even a lot of Christians are evolutionists. <clears throat> I'll talk about that. <clears throat> That's not true, for one thing. There are many, many great scientists who are not evolutionists. Many of the, many of the non-Christian scientists are beginning to question evolution. That's not a very good theory. Uh, so those are kind of some of the things. There may be some others on here. Uh, so, so in Veritas, I, I mentioned some of the things we studied, the evidence for, the evidence for, you know, the, 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 the Bible's true. That's one. The evidence that Jesus rose from the dead is another. The evidence that there's a God, you know, but, but do you remember anything else I said that we're going to be studying? The particular areas that give the evidence. Do you remember any of the areas? Like one of them is archaeology. What? Yeah, thermodynamics. That's right. That's good. I'm, I'm impressed, Parker. That, well, thermo, the law of thermodynamics is, it points to God. That's good. Anything else come to mind? Well, the, the Bible has a lot of fulfilled prophecies. Fulfilled prophecies is pretty powerful evidence for God. Early Bible manuscripts, we'll, we'll look at that. Early church history, we'll look at that. Molecular biology, which is related to thermodynamics, we'll look at that. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's several things like that that we'll look at, the, the fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, okay. We'll also look at some crazy ideas that people get about Jesus and show why they're irrational, and we'll talk about secular humanism and critical theory and stuff like that. Okay, why do you think, and, you, and I, I mentioned this, but you don't, you don't have to use what I said. You just come out of your own brain. Why do you think so few Christians know about what we're talking about in this course? They're, they're, you'd be shocked, maybe you wouldn't, but you, it's hard to find Christians who know this stuff. Most Christians just aren't aware of it. Why do you think that's true? What, what's going on? I mean, just your own mind, your own thoughts. Why do you think mis, many, many people don't know this stuff? They weren't taught. Yeah, they weren't taught it, so they don't know it. They've never been. It's never been talked about before. They've never heard of it before. That's one reason. But why do you think that's true? Why do you think they weren't taught? What's going on? Got any thoughts? They just stay in their own like, personal bubble. I'm sorry? They just stay in their own like, personal bubble. Yeah, they, they're in their own personal bubble. I think that's a big one right there. They they know they believe. And if you said why I believe, they, they don't, they don't want to answer that. They just, well, I just believe. I know Jesus is real. He's real in my life. So... I don't need to answer those questions. They just don't feel a need. They're in their little pu personal bubble. They don't see the need. And and I tell you another thing that I understand this, and I'm not trying to argue with it, but I think we've got to be alert to it. What do we usually study? And when you go to church or Sunday school or go to uh, preaching service, what are we studying? What? Okay, studying about Jesus. Yeah. What book do we use? 
the Bible. Yeah, we use the Bible. And so we come to verses in the Bible. We talk about those verses. Now, there are verses like 1 Peter 3.15 that says we ought to know this stuff. But most of the time, people never get around to studying that. They just study other things in the Bible over and over and over again. And they never get around to, to, to trying to figure out how to, how to obey 1 Peter 3.15. So I think, that's, I think that's a big part of it. And if you hang out with Christians, and I believe you should, but you're hanging out with people that believe like you, right? And so they're not asking these questions. They already know Jesus is real. They know they can trust the Bible. They know God is real. Now, some of the people at church, especially young people like you, may be there and they have their doubts in the back of their mind, but they don't say anything about it. They just kind of think it. And then when they get old enough, they just they just leave. But they don't get those questions answered. You know, they've got they've got questions. They think they think they're real serious questions. They think it's a real reason not to believe. And they just and they need somebody to help them with it. But they just don't. In the church, we just don't talk about it much. How did Jesus say we're supposed to love God with all our what? Hearts, Hearts and minds, yeah, soul and strength and mind. And, may not, and I focus mainly on the word mind here because we need to learn how to think. We've got to discipline ourselves to think about these things. All right. Uh, we'll talk more about all this later. Let me go ahead and give this to you. And, uh, so that's pretty much what the rest of this course is going to be about. And I hope you will be very attentive and learn as much as you can. And you can keep these handouts if you if you want to, because someday you may wish you had them, believe me. Okay. All right, anything else before I pray? Father, thank you for what you've taught us today. I pray you'd help these kids take these things seriously. Help us to remember First Peter 3.15 is a command that we need to make sure that we can give an answer to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us, that we can make a defense. So help us to learn how to do that. Help us the rest of this day to walk with you to get wisdom from you, to give you lots of great gratitude and thanksgiving and praise. Uh, help us to be a blessing. Help us to be like Jesus. Even if other people around us are not being like Jesus, help us to be like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. God bless you guys. Stay in the battle.